In 1785, in an elementary school in Lower Saxony, on a lazy afternoon, a teacher said his students' busy work, sum all the numbers, he said, from one to a hundred, and settled back to enjoy his paper. But after only a minute, one student raised his hand and announced the solution, 5,050. The cleverest child had seen that every pair of numbers in the series, say one to a hundred, two and 99, adds up to 101, and that there are 50 such pairs. The inventor of this little trick was Carl Friedrich Gauss, who would grow up to become the greatest mathematician since antiquity, and the formula works for all series of numbers that are evenly spaced. When we talk about how technology can solve big problems, we often borrow this language of mathematics. We hope for insights like Gauss's, which provide a shortcut or a breakthrough. In the jargon of Silicon Valley, we want disruptions, technological innovations that appear like miracles and displace tired ways of doing things, often by competing on price. But in the real world, Technological solutions are not so easily won because big problems are civilizational, and they are hard. So here's a more difficult problem that humanity did solve. The ozone layer of the stratosphere absorbs around 97% of the uh, sun's ultraviolet radiation. Without its clement umbrella, we'd get cancers. In 1974, acting on a hint from the environmentalist James Lovelock, two chemists named Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina predicted a depletion of the ozone caused by our own technologies, the chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, used in refrigerators, air conditioning systems, and aerosols. They said that CFCs would rise high enough into the solar radiation that the solar radiation would split off a chlorine atom and react with the ozone, destroying the ozone layer. In a few years later, scientists confirmed the hypothesis and then observed a huge decrease in ozone around the poles, holes. But in 1976, the National Academy of Sciences endorsed Roland and Molina's, Molina's hypothesis over the objections of industry. And in 1978, Norway, the US, and Canada banned the use of CFCs in aerosol sprays. And since 1987, 197 countries have signed the Montreal Protocol, which committed the world to phasing out CFCs. When we look at the world, there are evils that seem to survive identification as evils, like environmental degradation, and goods that we know are good that we cannot embrace. That's because the changes can seem too much, or they come too quickly, or they are unbearable to contemplate. But in the case of CFCs, we were able to act. Why? Well, first, although the science was incredibly complicated, it was incontrovertible. The impact of CFCs was confirmed within a decade, and industrial opposition to its regulation collapsed. Second of all, our institutions were able to devise and impose strong and rational commitments. Third, we already had technological alternatives, or we could quickly create them. And finally, the politics of the time were right. The public could grasp the idea of a hole in the stratosphere, and politicians found some personal or party benefit in supporting national laws and international accords. Since I spoke to Solve, to Ted, three years ago, about how technology can solve big problems, I've been doing just that. I've been building an organization at MIT called Solve, which seeks to discover, evaluate, and advance solutions to big technological problems. I've discovered that conditions similar to Montreal must exist for there to be progress. We must understand the problem. Our institutions must provide leadership and rational policies. Entrepreneurs and industry must find in labs technologies that they can test, develop, and manufacture at scale. And politicians and the general public must actually care to solve the problem. Much of the work of Solve has been done against the dark background hum of the great challenge of our own day, climate change. But the problem of climate change is much harder 
than the depletion of the ozone by CFCs. It's, it's wickedly hard. Once again, the culprits are our own technologies, but this time they are foundational. They are the hydrocarbons we burn to fuel our technological civilization, but which contribute to the greenhouse effect. At more than 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere and enormous reserves of fossil fuels, some part of which we will use, at least two degrees of global warming, once thought the limit of what we could bear, now seems baked in and more is possible. It will be hotter. The sea levels will rise and flood cities and towns. There will be more droughts and storms and crops will fail. The nations will fight and refugees will stream from the poor parts of the world. Faced with all this, it's very easy to lose heart, but it's never over until it's over and life goes on until it doesn't. We have to decide what we want to do next. In short, don't panic. We have to... <laughs> don't panic. In short, we need to begin to investigate the portion of climate change that is genuinely not well understood, including climate sensitivity, which will tell us how bad it will all be and how fast it will happen. We need to swiftly replace fossil fuels with the clean energy technologies we do possess, such as solar and wind, while researching and developing solutions that still elude us, like how will we store electricity generated from intermittent sources, such as solar and wind, and how will we build cheaper, safer nuclear reactors? We will have to imagine the economic, the agricultural, and the engineering implications of a hotter future and plan accordingly. All of this will require smart energy policies, including a price on carbon and a substantial increase in how much nations spend on energy, R&D. Technology which has expanded human possibilities and grown wealth can also create problems, like global warming. Under certain conditions, technology can solve those problems. But there are no miracles. We have to want the solutions and cheerfully accept that the solving won't be easy. Thank you.